All right. Well, let me go okay, ahead and begin. We're, we're ready to go. Okay, great. Um, my name is Dr. Rodney Stewart, and I am Associate Professor of History at the University of South Carolina, Salkahatchee. Um, I am, uh, by training, a Civil War historian. Um, I have a PhD from, uh, from Auburn University. I worked with Ken No uh, there at Auburn, and so I have a master's degree from Western uh, Carolina University, where I worked with Peter Carmichael uh, on developing a master's thesis there. Um, Really, uh, I think the, the, the bulk of my research uh, in Civil War history really deals with home front issues. Um, I wrote a book, uh, and some of you may or may not have heard of it, uh, but it's uh, entitled David Shank and the Contours of Confederate Identity. Um, and it's, it's a biography, obviously, but uh, what I tried to do with that biography is to, uh, to demonstrate how um, the secession crisis and the coming of the Civil War created an opportunity for uh, professional middle class men like David Shank, whom I'll mention in my talk tonight. It created an opportunity for them to create for themselves uh, a rather unique Confederate identity. Um, well, in, in that book, I, uh, I detailed some of David Shank's uh, activities as a receiver under the act of sequestration. And uh, in, in writing that chapter, I became very, very fascinated with this whole topic. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Confederate um, sequestration or Confederate confiscation um, and how it was applied um, and what were the consequences uh, of this, uh, the application of this law. Um, and so I wanna begin uh, by just uh, making a couple of points. First off, you're gonna hear me refer to the term alien enemy several times throughout the course of, of my talk. Um, and it's important that you all just kind of tuck away in the back of your minds that the Confederate government defined the term alien enemy as anyone whose domicile was outside of the Confederacy, okay? So as long as you're living outside of the Confederacy, you were considered an alien enemy. And any property that you owned uh, within the Confederate States was liable for confiscation, okay? That's gonna prove to be problematic as you'll see in just a moment. Um, in, uh, in terms of context, uh, my talk tonight really can fit into two categories. First off, and this is uh, conveniently alliterative, um, uh, this, is a, this is a discussion that deals with confiscation, coercion, and corruption on the Confederate home fronts. Um, and I think that as I go through my talk, I think you'll begin to see the, the profound potential for corruption and how that corruption actually played out over the course of the Civil War. In a broader contextual sense, however, um, this talk and this study really fits into uh, a much broader discussion of Confederate nationalism. I offer this, uh, this research, and for what it's worth, if I can pause for just one moment, this research comes out of 12 years of research into this topic. And uh, ultimately it, it's going to be presented in the form of, of, of a manuscript, a book manuscript that will be entitled um, uh, An Illegal Violence, the Story of Confederate Sequestration. What I'm trying to demonstrate with this research is that uh, contrary to what historian Gary Gallagher has asserted uh, in his book, The Confederate War, uh, that the vast majority of Southerners were not loyal Confederates. What I would argue is that overwhelmingly, uh, what you have uh, in the South with regard to, to loyalties during the time of the revolution was virtually exactly the same as at the time of the Civil War. In other words, one third of this, the, the Southern population uh, could be considered loyal Confederates. One third of the Southern population could be considered unionists. And the, the final third of the population were really just people who wanted to keep their heads down and get through this madness 
and chaos with as little damage as possible. Um, well, the act of sequestration really has an awful lot to do with coercing loyalty, as I think you'll see in just one moment. So that said, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started uh, uh, with my presentation. I'm going to, to read this to you. And my wife told me earlier, you know, you really need to, to be able to just kind of do this, you know, on the fly, which I would love to be able to do. But the problem with this topic is that it's legal in nature and the law is technical. The devil is in the details. And therefore, I'm going to have to, uh, to read it to you slowly uh, so that you catch the details. Uh, and I'm going to, in my PowerPoint here, I'm going to try to, to capture some of those details and some of the significance as I go along. So as I begin here, Confederate sequestration. During the Civil War, shysters and con men abounded on the Southern home fronts. Arguably the greatest concentration of villainous characters were found within the halls of Confederate justice. District court judges, receivers, and grand juries armed with the Confederate act of sequestration presided over a campaign of confiscation and intimidation to enforce loyalty and squelch dissent. By April 1865, millions of dollars of debts owed to Northern creditors, along with hundreds of thousands of pieces of real and personal property were seized and sold at auction. Untold numbers of common people were stripped of their property, fined or threatened, some were imprisoned or worse. The financial devastation resulting from the sequestration of property and the collection of debts seized from so-called alien enemies, uh, alien enemies of the Confederacy would last for generations. Crippling debt peonage and crushing poverty lasting well into the next century became the legacy of property seizure on the Confederate home front. Officers of the Confederate district courts were the authors of financial ruination for so many ordinary Southern folk. The 1861 act of sequestration empowered Southern district court judges, receivers, and grand juries to engage in acts of legal turpitude perpetrated against their fellow Southerners. Tyranny, greed, and corruption abounded as court officials often enriched themselves with property confiscated from those accused, sometimes falsely, of, of disloyalty to the Confederate cause. Acting with impunity, district court officials menaced the home front seizing and selling property at will. The act of sequestration and its lasting impact on the Confederate home front is one of only a handful of Civil War topics that remains understudied. Yet a close examination of the day-to-day -day application of this law reveals that it was a law designed to control and intimidate ordinary folk. Its nefariousness hidden behind a veil of judicial secrecy and unseen by the public eye. It was characterized by a widespread disregard for civil liberties, personal property rights, and a vicious realpolitik overlooked by historians of the Civil War. Perhaps most significantly, the act of sequestration pulls the curtain back on the depth and strength of home front loyalty, revealing a rapacious court bureaucracy and a Confederate government deeply suspicious of its own people. Official government confiscation of private property during the Civil War began on August the 6th, 1861, when the United States Congress approved the first Confiscation Act, which laid the legal groundwork for federal forces to confiscate Southerners' private property being used to aid the rebellion. Although not directly mentioned in the act itself, it was understood and later confirmed by executive order that property included slaves or contraband as they would come to be known. With slave property now under direct threat by federal confiscation, the Confederate government in Richmond was compelled to act. A resolution introduced by Louisiana Congressman Duncan Kenner urged the Confederate Congress to consider the expediency of reporting a general confiscation bill. With that, drafting a reciprocal, reciprocal policy of confiscation became the, cover, the, the Confederate government's top priority. On August the 30th, 1861, Confederate lawmakers passed the act of sequestration uh, in direct response to federal confiscation policy. 
Its preamble charged that the government and people of the United States have departed from the usages of civilized warfare in confiscating and destroying the property of the Confederate States of all kinds, whether used for military purposes or not. As a result, our only protection against such wrongs is to be found in such measures of retaliation as will ultimately indemnify our own citizens for their losses and restrain the wanton excesses of our enemies. Such provocative language is noticeably absent from the Northern Confiscation Law, suggesting the value Confederates attach to private property, especially slave property, and their disdain for Northern attempts to violate its sanctity. Ostensibly, the Confederate Congress intended sequestration to strike a blow at Northern financial interests within the Confederacy. It called for duly appointed Confederate officers to locate all and every lands, tenements, hereditaments, goods and chattels, rights and credits within these Confederate states and every right and interest therein held, owned, possessed, or enjoyed by or for any enemy alien. Such property would be sequestered by the Confederate States of America and in turn sold with the proceeds paid into a fund administered by the Confederate Treasury Department. A board of three sequestration officials would hear indemnity claims made by loyal Confederates whose personal property had fallen prey to confiscation by the Union. The board would then pass on its recommendation to the Confederate Congress and after a special hearing, Congress would approve or reject the claims. Those claims approved by the Confederate Congress would then be sent back to the Treasury to issue an indemnity to the claimants. The circuitous route established for indemnity claims ultimately gave Congress the final word on compensation. And after 12 years of researching this topic, I can tell you, I've never found anyone who has ever, who ever received a, a, an indemnity. The wording of the indemnity clause, however, is problematic for it stated that personal property confiscated by the US government was eligible to be held for full indemnity of any true and loyal citizen or resident of these Confederate states or other person aiding said Confederate states in the prosecution of the present war with the United States. Nowhere did the act define or offer any criteria for identifying true and loyal citizens. The ambiguity established by the, the Confederate Congress in defining loyal citizens eligible for indemnity created a veil of secrecy behind which the disbursement of compensation uh, would operate. It also signaled that the Southern Congress, wary of the depth and strength of home front loyalty, was reluctant to offer a definition specifically identifying loyal Confederates. Perhaps, Confederate officials wanted to ensure that planters whose slave property was being confiscated by federal armies were the only sort of loyal Confederates that could expect to be compensated for their losses. Southerners bore the brunt of confiscation during the Civil War. Like federal confiscation, which was enforced primarily by military officers as Union armies advanced into Confederate territory, sequestration would also be enforced on the Confederate home front. The difficulty with enforcing the law lay in locating alien owned debts and property. As a matter of practicality, Confederate legislators dismissed concerns about privacy and the sanctity of attorney client privilege and chose to target business, tax, and legal records as useful tools for shedding light on the whereabouts of some of it. The bulk of information regarding the location of liable property and debts, however, came from ordinary citizens. The authors of the Sequestration Act intended to squeeze the home front for information. As historian Brian Dirk has noted, the Sequestration Act required every Southerner to turn informant for the government. The act specifically stated, it is and shall be the duty of each and every citizen of these Confederate states speedily to give information to the officers charged with execution of this law. Indeed, should anyone prove reluctant to provide the government the information it sought, sequestration officials were granted extraordinarily punitive powers to search out and seize all suspect real estate, property, and debts. 
Enforcement of the law fell to two arms of the Confederate district courts repurposed specifically to help administer sequestration, receivers and federal grand juries. Receivers were lawyers appointed by district court judges and tasked with overseeing legal procedure, taking custody of sequestered debts and property and arranging the public sale of sequestered goods. Federal grand juries consisting of as many as 23 men were impaneled in every receiver district. They aided receivers by hearing testimony and interrogating those suspected of knowing the whereabouts of liable property, as well as those people whose loyalty to the Confederate cause was, in their view, questionable. Operating like a secret police force, both receivers and grand jurymen randomly interrogated individuals and diligently kept a probing, suspicious eye on citizens in their districts. Attorneys, agents, and former business partners were of keen interest to the Confederate courts. The authors of, sequest of the sequestration law made it clear that those who in the past represented the interests of one now accused of being an alien enemy were by default guilty by association. It shall be the duty of every attorney, agent, or former partner holding or controlling such goods or credits for any such alien enemy speedily to inform the receiver and to render an account thereof and to place the same in the hands of such receiver, whereupon such person shall be fully acquitted of all responsibility of all property reported and turned in. To drive the point home, the authors of the sec of sequestration warned that any such person willfully failing to give such information shall be guilty of a high misdemeanor. Armed with these extraordinary uh, powers, receivers in grand juries were, were a threatening presence on the home front. Are you not agent for a man named Alexander, an alien enemy who has interest in lands known as the Campbell Survey? wrote receiver Archimedes Davis to William Nash of Abingdon, Virginia. Tell all you know in regard to that or any other lands owned by alien enemies. To ensure success at locating alien assets, the Sequestration Act required and the district courts demanded that all residents be immediately forthcoming in reporting all alien assets in their possession and inform the government of any such assets possessed by a neighbor. For some, the opportunity to exact revenge on a rival or the prospect of personal gain was a luring temptation to provide receivers and grand juries false information about a neighbor's property. In December, 1861, Virginia receiver Archimedes Davis took delivery of a letter from Lipscomb Pomeroy informing him that in the year 1859, there was sent to this county, Washington County, Virginia, by me from Letcher County in Kentucky, a certain small horse belonging to Alexander E. Adams, formerly of this county, but since 1859, has lived in Letcher up to the raising of the armies. Pomeroy alleged that Adams was disloyal and had joined the Union Army. He further stated that the horse in question was given to Adam's father, William, and that he reckoned the value of the horse to be $150. Pomeroy later falsely informed Davis that Alexander Adams also owned the house his father, William, was living in. Now, to be sure, Adams was serving in the Union Army, but the horse in question belonged to his father, who had since sold it for $175. Unfortunately for William Adams, the court took action against him, seizing the value of the horse and sequestering and auctioning his house. Failure to comply with the district court was dangerous. The act empowered officials to fine and jail individuals refusing to answer questions regarding the whereabouts of alien assets. Violation of the law was a high misdemeanor and those caught concealing liable property or debts faced a fine double the value of the hidden property, as well as the regular fine and imprisonment for as long as five years. Furthermore, sequestration proceedings for property and real estate particularly fell into the category of an in rem action to determine title to property. Defendants named in such a proceeding were not required to be present for sequestration to go forward. There's your due process right there. Most significantly, those to whom inter uh, interrogatories were sent 
and the hundreds of thousands against whom garnishment proceedings initiated were considered disloyal by Confederate officials, and they became vulnerable to abuse at the hands of unscrupulous district court officials. For example, uh, in October 1862, uh, Virginia receiver Francis L. Smith petitioned Judge James Halliburton of the District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia for a writ, for a writ to sequester a large amount of real and personal property, an exact description of which is to your petitioner unknown. <clears throat> Smith claimed that the undescribed property belonged to alien enemies whose names and domiciles are unknown to your petitioner. Nevertheless, Smith was certain that the undescribed property belonging to unknown alien enemies was in the possession of William Terriner of Loudoun County. In still another case, highlighting the court's abuse of power, in October 1862, Virginia receiver Thomas N. Campbell accused J.T. Young of Petersburg of being indebted to unknown alien enemies. Although Campbell did not know the names of the people Young allegedly owed, he was certain that they lived in New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and other states of the United States. Furthermore, Campbell charged in his petition that J.T. Young may have paid over some of said debts since the 22nd of May, 1861, which was, in effect, an accusation of treason, which, upon conviction, carried the death penalty. The Sequestration Act charged the Confederate Attorney General with putting the law into effect. It set no parameters or limitations on the power of receivers and grand juries to acquire information and to receive, I'm sorry, to, to seize property and debts. Furthermore, it was silent on nearly all interpretive matters, thus placing the awesome responsibility of defining the terms loyal Confederate and alien enemy entirely in the hands of local sequestration officials. Moreover, unlike other federal laws passed by the Confederate Congress, including impressment and tax in kind, which were administered by state officials, sequestration proceedings were the exclusive jurisdiction of the Confederate district courts. Judges thus wielded unprecedented and concentrated authority. For district court judges with jurisdictions immediately along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, the first order of business was clearing the admiralty and prize dockets. Once that business was settled, judges then turned their full attention to ordering their courts and implementing the sequestration law. Acquiring the right cadre of court officers was paramount and judges carefully, carefully selected men uh, for their devotion to the Confederate cause. Receivers and uh, clerks of court were the top priority, followed by marshals and bailiffs. In most states, receivers were responsible for selecting men to serve on the grand jury and perhaps not surprisingly, the men they chose were loyal to them. Across the Confederacy, stay laws drastically reduced the number of criminal and civil cases allowed to be brought before district courts, leaving sequestration proceedings and cases involving treason as the court's sole business. As soon as the courts were set in order, sequestration proceedings could, could begin. Thomas Bragg, uh, the first attorney general of the Confederacy, uh, established uh, procedures for the courts by issuing a series of standard legal forms used mainly by receivers and clerks of court to facilitate sequestration proceedings. The first form was known as a garnishment, which summoned an individual or agent of an alien enemy to appear before the bench to give answer as to the whereabouts of liable materials in their possession. An individual received a garnishment based on information obtained by members of a grand jury through interrogations. The recipient of a garnishment was automatically suspected of unionist sympathies by virtue of the fact that he had not been forthcoming with information about the confiscable property in his possession. He was also liable to pay a fine or suffer imprisonment as per the stipul stipulations of the sequestration law. Along with the garnishment was sent a bill of interrogatories containing five very specific and probing questions defendants were required to answer in writing. Most people receiving the Bill of Interrogatories found it necessary to hire an attorney to help draft their written response to the court. Such was the case for Mary Barnhart and Adeline White, both of Cabarrus County, North Carolina. Both women were illiterate, 
elderly, and living alone on land left to them by deceased husbands. They both had sons set to inherit land, but each was said to be living in California. Uh, without bothering to confirm the whereabouts of the two men, Asa Biggs, the judge of North Carolina, declared the sons alien enemies and ordered their respective lands sequestered and sold. Both Mary and Adeline were left and depended upon the goodwill of neighbors and friends for their maintenance. Women alone on the home front were easy targets for court officials, and judges applied the sequestration law with cold indifference to circumstance. Those with no political connections or legal recourse were at the greatest risk of losing property, whether they were associated with uh, alien enemies or not. The case of Catherine Young of Abingdon, Virginia is a prime example of the risks to which women on the home front were exposed as a result of the Confederate government's policy of sequestration. Young was the youngest of three children. Her father seems to have died when Catherine was just a small girl. So she grew up in the care of her mother, Mary. In an affidavit to Confederate Judge John Brockenborough of the Western District of Virginia, Catherine's uncle, Jacob Lynch, described her as being of weak and imbecile mind. Catherine's mother died in 1857, but upon her deathbed requested that her daughter be encouraged to move to Iowa to live with her older sister, Eliza Ann. In his affidavit, Jacob Lynch explained that Catherine was induced by her friends to dispose of some property, which she had acquired from her brother, Joseph Young, who was deceased. A neighbor, William M. Grimm, purchased the property, which was all Catherine owned or possessed in 1859 for $1,400. According to Lynch, the terms of the sale required Grimm to pay half the price up front with the balance due in December, 1861. The proceeds of the sale were intended for Catherine's future maintenance, but receiver Archimedes Davis seized upon the debt Grimm owed Catherine, and Judge Brockenborough, in spite of the unusual circumstances of the case, ordered it sequestered and paid into the sequestration fund. Catherine was left with nothing. Her fate is unknown. The cases of Mary Barnhart, Adeline White, and Catherine Young demonstrate the Confederate court's willingness to exploit the vulnerable. In each case, the courts were technically conforming to the letter of the law, but they were also sending a clear and threatening message to others on the home front that real power was in the hands of the judicial bureaucracy. The Confederate district courts were single-minded in their quest to deprive anyone of all they possessed, especially if their circumstances appeared questionable or out of the ordinary. In 1863, Margaret Wallach of Culpeper, Virginia, was living at her childhood home, but her father, William Wallach, had been jailed in Washington, D.C. since the war began. Receiver Francis Smith petitioned Judge Halliburton to sequester the imprisoned Wallach's real and personal estate because his domicile was outside of the Confederate States. Halliburton agreed and ordered Margaret Wallach evicted from the property. Soon after, William Wallach's entire estate was sold at auction. Women weren't the only people turned out of house and home by the Confederate courts. Before the war, Peter Kemper was an employee of the Wyckoff Gold Mining Company in Fauquier County, Virginia. The company was incorporated in the state of New York sometime in the 1850s. Kemper and his young family lived on the company's 800-acre property until 1862 when Judge Halliburton declared the Wyckoff Company an alien enemy and ordered the sheriff to evict the Kemper family. Like so many others ensnared in the sequestration frenzy, Peter Kemper was considered disloyal, arrested, and jailed for nearly a year because he had not been forthcoming with court officials about the gold mine's ownership. Even supporters of the Confederate cause weren't safe from the masters of sequestration. William Johnson of Scott County, Virginia, inherited 500 acres of land from his parents upon their deaths many years before. And he and his younger brother, Walter, lived there upon the, up to the outbreak of the war. William, who was a staunch supporter of the Confederate cause, was on a business trip to Indiana when the war began. Unable to return directly to his home in Virginia, William traveled to Confederate-controlled territory in Missouri, and from there sought to return to Virginia. 
in March 1862, acting on false information provided by the local grand jury that William Johnson was an alien enemy, Archimedes Davis filed a petition for garnishment of property in Judge Brockenborough's court. Walter Johnson appeared before the judge several times to argue that he and his brother William were loyal Confederates and that William was in fact in Confederate controlled territory in Missouri, trying to return to Virginia. Walter provided the court with several sworn statements from friends attesting to his and William's loyalty to the Confederacy. Brockenborough, however, remained unconvinced and ordered Johnson's 500 acres of land sequestered and sold at auction. William Johnson was branded an alien enemy simply by virtue of the fact that he was not in Virginia at the proper time. Until the war's end, Archimedes Davis and the grand jury harassed Walter Johnson with garnishments for alleged debts to alien enemies. In a similar case, J.B. Allen, a Wilmington, North Carolina merchant who owned several storefronts in town, was accused by a neighbor, William Gordon, of being disloyal. In Gordon's petition to receiver Dubrutz Cutler, he alleged that Allen, a native of New Hampshire, had gone over to the enemy. Cutler seized Allen's storefront, uh, storefronts and successfully petitioned Judge Asa Biggs to declare Allen an alien enemy. Allen's property went up for auction within days of Judge Biggs' decision and accuser William Gordon purchased it at a rock bottom price. About a month after the sale of his property, J.B. Uh, Allen returned home to Wilmington from behind enemy lines where he had been trapped for several weeks, unable to return. Authorities promptly arrested him and hastily handed him over to military authorities to be punished for disloyalty. Slave property was particularly valuable and court officials were eager to seize as much as possible. In Rockbridge County, Virginia, receiver Joseph Steele seized and sold the property of Cyrus McCormick, inventor of the famed mechanical reaper, who after a violent confrontation with a grand jury member in his district, fled to Illinois for safety in October, 1862. Among McCormick's property was an enslaved woman named Emily and her infant child, both of whom Steele exposed to sale at public auction on the fifth day of January, 1863 in the town of Lexington. The highest bidder purchased them for $2,500. Slaves commanded high prices uh, in the market even late into the war, and that fact fostered corruption among some court officials. One particular incident sheds light on, on the value of enslaved property and the risks court, court officers were willing to take to seize it. In the case of Confederate States versus Fenton and Fern, Receiver Francis Smith filed a petition of garnishment for slave property against two attorneys who, in January 1863, were executors of the estate of Eden Carter of Albemarle County, Virginia. In his petition, Smith stated that the slaves in the defendant's possession were slated to become, by the terms of Carter's will, the property of Thomas Kent and Francis Carter, both longtime residents of Ohio. Smith named all 11 slaves in question and provided ages for most of them. We have Amistad, 56, Hannah, his wife, 40, and their children, John, 20, George, 18, Jeff, 16, Jenny, 12, Gilmore, 7, Hero, Bartley, Frank, and Susan Jane. Judge Halliburton's response to Smith's petition was predictable. He determined that Thomas Kent and Francis Carter were indeed alien enemies living in Ohio and that the said Negroes should rightfully be sequestered and delivered up to Francis Smith, receiver for district number one. On November the 18th, 1863, Smith reported to Halliburton on the dispensation of most of the slaves. After giving notice by advertisement in the Richmond Dispatch of the time, place, and terms of sale, the receiver had Amistad, Hannah and their children, Hero, Bartley, Frank, Gilmore, Susan Jane, and George sold at public auction for a total of $16,555. Three other bonds people from Smith's original petition, John, Jeff, and Jenny, all among the most valuable of the lots, were not part of the transaction. 
the court record is silent about their fates, leaving one to wonder if Halliburton and Smith somehow profited by clandestinely selling them. Sworn statements found in the case file indicate a profound irony lurking behind this incident of sequestration. Thomas Kent and Francis Carter, who were to inherit Amistad, Hannah, and their children from Eden Carter, but who were declared alien enemies because they were residents of Ohio, were in fact residing in Albemarle County, Virginia, as late as November 1862. Both men were known critics of the district court and its officers presiding over sequestration and had drawn the ire of the local grand jury. Kent and Carter had fled to Ohio from their Virginia homes in an effort to save their lives. Seizing and selling the property of individuals accused of being alien enemies of the Confederacy, whether they were or not, proved a lucrative business. The potential for corruption was absolutely abundantly evident, even as lawmakers drafted the Sequestration Act. To, to curb possible abuses of power, the authors of sequestration established fixed salaries for marshals, receivers, and bailiffs, but judges' salaries were set at an amount equal to those of their respective state Supreme Court justices, which varied widely among the states. Envy among some district judges toward their counterparts elsewhere in the Confederacy was palpable. As one historian observed, it's not hard to imagine the dissatisfaction which was produced among the district judges by these unequal results. For example, the judge in North Carolina, Asa Biggs, found his salary was only $2,500, whereas, whereas to the north of him, judges in Virginia got $3,000, and to the south of him, the judge of South Carolina received $3,500. Yet the North Carolina judge had three divisions to preside over, and his neighbors had only two divisions each. Perhaps then it's not surprising that the North Carolina District Court saw some of the most egregious examples <coughs> excuse me, uh, of, of corruption among court officials. David Shank, uh, receiver for the Western, uh, Western Piedmont District, is a prime example. At the outset of the war, Shank was a struggling middle-class lawyer from Lincolnton, North Carolina. Judge Asa Biggs appointed him receiver of the district in June 1862 as a political favor. Both Shank and Biggs were founding members of the Southern Rights Party, North Carolina's only pro-secession uh, political party. By September, uh, Shank recorded in his diary that he had sold $20,000 worth of confiscated real estate in his district. In the weeks that followed, Shank went on a spending spree, purchasing an 18-year-old male slave named Charles for $1,225, a new lot in town, and an additional three acres of land on the outskirts of town. He was also purchasing materials to build a new house. What was the source of this newfound wealth? The receiver's ledger for the sequestration fund from the Confederate Treasury offers a clue. According to the ledger, which recorded all funds remitted to the Treasury by each receiver every quarter, David Schenck's district remitted only $3,610.24 in the year 1862. It also shows that Schenck was paid $319.58 to cover the cost of expenses incurred while executing the duties of his office. There is no evidence, in other words, that the full $20,000 worth of confiscated real estate sold at auction in September was ever deposited in the sequestration fund in Richmond. In South Carolina, corruption among court officials was even more blatant. In September 1861, a district attorney indicted Charleston merchant Walter Huey and charged him with being an alien enemy. Judge Andrew McGrath ordered all of Huey's possessions, sequestered and delivered the same into the custody of John Caldwell, receiver, and that the said receiver do hold the same subject to the further order of the bench. Meanwhile, Huey, who was living in Charleston, mounted a vigorous defense and ultimately persuaded McGrath that he was in fact a loyal Confederate. Huey's property, however, had not been delivered over to Caldwell, but rather remained in the custody of, of the bailiff, Michael McGuire. 
One month later, after Huey satisfied the courts of his loyalty, Judge McGrath ordered Caldwell to return Huey's property. To the, to the judge's shock, it was never delivered over to Huey. Further inquiry revealed that Michael McGuire, McGrath's bailiff, had disregarded the process of the court and instead sold Huey's property, scoring a tidy profit for himself. An embarrassed McGrath responded with a bench order demanding that McGuire appear and show cause why for such conduct his office should not be vacated. In many instances, district courts allowed sequestration, the Sequestration Act to facilitate covetousness in some communities. For example, in November 1861 in Galveston, Texas, the grand jury took the deposition of John H. Crossman, who alleged that J. Hawley, owner of a dredge boat docked in Galveston, was an unsafe man in the South, that two years prior he overheard Hawley utter seditionary sentiments. He also informed the grand jury that Hawley owned land on the San Antonio River. On Crossman's testimony alone, Hawley was arrested, declared an alien enemy, and imprisoned. His dredge boats and his land on the San Antonio River were sequestered and sold. Moreover, as was true of so many others victimized by the corruption associated with the sequestration law, all of Hawley's property ended up in the hands of his accuser, John Crossman. The, Con the Confederate District Court for the Eastern District of Texas was unusually active in seizing land and property. William Pitt Ballinger, the receiver for the district, personally orchestrated the sequestration and sale of hundreds of properties and took custody of over hundreds more. Perhaps it's no coincidence that after the war, Ballinger went into the real estate business. When the sequestration law went into effect in August 1861, it was made retroactive to May 22nd. As might be expected the first year that the sequestration act was, was enforced, large numbers of garnishments for real estate, property, and debts were recorded. By 1863, however, the number of garnishments for real estate and property began to decrease, while at the same time, the number of garnishments for debts began to increase sharply. Indeed, the district court records for the Cape Fear District of North Carolina for the 1863 November ter term record no garnishments for property uh, at all, only petitions for debts. By 1865, nearly 85% of all sequestration proceedings were for debts owed to alien enemies. This fact raises an important question. How were Southerners increasingly becoming indebted to alien enemies? How would it be possible for common folks on the home front to get around the insurmountable barriers of battlefields, armies, and the war in general to either borrow money or purchase goods from sellers outside of the Confederate states? But the answer is simple, they couldn't. How then is the, the increase in garnishments for debts explained? The court records offer a clue. The districts that saw the sharpest increase in garnishments for debts as the war progressed were Southern and Southeastern Virginia, the Piedmont and Mountain Districts of North Carolina, Northern Alabama, East Tennessee, West Texas, and the German district near San Antonio. In each of these districts, a strong unionist sentiment dominated before the war. Additionally, most of these districts sheltered large numbers of deserters. Many were epicenters for anti-war protests or peace movements. Using the powers granted by the act of sequestration, the Confederate courts sought to punish residents of these districts by depriving many of their land and property and by extorting money from many others. It is deceiving to say, as the authors of the act of sequestration did, that the law dealt a blow to Northern financial interests in the Confederate States. In fact, the law was unnecessary as the war itself delivered the greatest blow to Northern economic concerns in the South. Southerners were not paying debts owed to Northern creditors. That was treasonous and fraught with all manner of risks. The act of sequestration was meant to compensate loyal Confederates for losses resulting from union confiscation, using proceeds from the sale of property or the collection of debts owed to Northerners. But in reality, this rarely, if ever, is how the law functioned. 
The great irony of the act of sequestration is that a law designed to punish alien enemies and northern creditors in the end punished only common folks on the southern home fronts. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for Rodney? Anybody out there got questions? Well, I, I guess not. Uh, I'd give people a minute to unmute, maybe. Yes. If you have a question, make sure you unmute yourself to ask it. Rodney, it's interesting. You were talking about the, um, especially about Wilmington, having that stuff about Wilmington in there. Yes. So I, I would imagine, too, being a, a port city, there was probably a lot of it concerning the, the shipping and stuff, too. Um, yes and no. Um, more so in, in Charleston, and especially at the beginning of the war. Um, can you hear me? Am I coming through? Yes. Okay. Um, in Charleston, you may or may not be aware of the fact that uh, many of the Charleston merchants uh, have very close personal and family connections with a lot of Boston and New York families. Right. Um, and so early on at the outset of the war, you see a whole lot of confiscation of, of businesses, uh, you know, property associated with businesses, boats and things like that. Um, not so much in, in Wilmington. Um, you see more the confiscation of, of farms and uh, small pieces of property, which is really what surprised me. The story of Adeline White, for example, of Cabarrus County, this, uh, this poor right. elderly woman who was living on a dower. She had her dower taken away from her because her son was in California and under, under you know, under unknown circumstances. I mean, if you think about how many Southern young men went to California between 1848 and the outset of the Civil War. Oh, yeah. And those uh, were still in California when the war began. All of the property they owned in, in the South was then forfeit. That's... Uh, that's one of the tyrannies associated with, uh, with the act of sequestration. Okay. okay. Uh, question, uh, Rodney, what happened after the war? Were some of these things fixed? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, this, is, this is another, you're going to read about this in, in my forthcoming book. Um, in some case, well, first of all, so let me begin by saying in 1862, the uh, United States Congress passed a resolution that declared any legislation passed by the Confederate Congress to be null and void, as if it never actually happened, okay? And the, so at the end of the war, um, if you were indebted to, say, a merchant in, uh, in Philadelphia, um, and you were compelled to pay that debt uh, into the sequestration fund, after the war, you were still liable for that debt with interest, okay? And so they, they, get, they get burdened doubly with, with this debt. Um, there are many people after the war who want their property back. And in the case of David Shank, for example, who helped himself to the property of a whole lot of people living round about, um, uh, they, you know, they threatened him and they, they, you know, they, they wanted their property back. And as a way of protecting himself, David Shank associated himself with the Ku Klux Klan. And that was a way of, of uh, making sure that he could hold on to the property that he had taken and fend off challenges from disgruntled neighbors. The long and the short of it is some people got their property back a lot of people certainly did not. In mm -hmm. most cases, the struggle to get their property back involved a lengthy uh, court battle um, that usually went at least to the state Supreme Court, if not to uh, the United States Supreme Court. Okay. okay. Uh, have you looked into uh, the Northern Confiscation Act and was that as corruptly applied as well? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, David Hamilton, who uh, is, uh, is a PhD from Harvard in history and in, uh, a JD in law, he's now the, the, the Dean of the Law School at uh, UNLV. He wrote a book called uh, The Limits of Sovereignty, and it's a legal history where he basically just 
compares the confiscation law to the act of sequestration. And really what he, what he, what he does is he demonstrates that uh, the Civil War constitutes this uh, a period of, of transition in legal thinking. The bottom line is what he concludes is that uh, the Confederacy exercised the act of sequestration, which really has its roots going back to uh, the American Revolution, right? Uh, and it's based upon the idea that uh, you can uh, confiscate property without compensation, which flies in the face of English common law and by extension, American law, because this is considered a writ of attainder. It's the condemnation of blood, okay? The Northern Confiscation Act, uh, when it was passed, there was a great deal of misgiving about uh, confiscating property. And in fact, it led to a, a healthy debate in Congress about whether or not Congress had the right to confiscate uh, property without uh, compensation. And when it was all said and done, by the end of the war, uh, the, the consensus was that uh, they, they would have to offer compensation for property uh, confiscated during the war. So were the Lee compensated uh, for Arlington? I'm sorry, could you say that again, please? Were the Lees compensated for Arlington? Well, there were some exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> and Lee would be one of them. <laughs> well, did not well, I, I'm speaking in general terms of, you know, uh, business owners or, or average people who, who may have lost their, their property. Um, uh, as Daniel Hamilton concludes, uh, you have... Um, the, the, the Federal uh, Confiscation Act, which really gave, uh, you know, federal armies sweeping powers to confiscate anything and everything they wanted. Um, and they were somewhat restrained, relatively speaking, uh, in exercising that power. Whereas Confederate courts uh, were not. Uh, they, my goodness, literally up to the last days of the war, they, Confederate courts were still trying to sequester property from and debts from people there on the home front. Are the U.S. confiscation laws still on the books? Are they still on the books? Yeah. That I, I, I don't know. I, I don't believe they are. I think they've been inactivated, uh, but I, I wouldn't know for certain. Would, Ronnie, was it, would you know if the slave owners in Delaware and Maryland were compensated for their slaves when they lost them after the war? They were not. They were not. Uh, with the passage of, uh, well, first of all, with, with the passage of um, uh, the Emancipation uh, Declaration, uh, they, they were not. Uh, so they, they were exempt from, uh, from any compensation. Face up. What? Rodney, mm -hmm. I was going to say, wasn't one of Lee's sons compensated down the road after Lee's death for Arlington? The Lee family uh, didn't receive money from the U.S. government for it. I, I honestly, I couldn't. I I can't speak with any authority on that. I, I don't know for certain. Um, uh, when I say that there are exceptions, I think Lee is probably the <laughs> the best exception, the best example of that. Um, there were some people that simply were not going to be compensated for for their losses. Um, but in general, as as I say, the uh, the average person, the business owner or farmer uh, or uh, you know the person on the home front, um, it could be. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody so have any other questions? This, oh, I was going to ask another question. Sorry. Hey, hey, Martha. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you're saying for the average person, were the wealthy relatively left alone despite their political leanings? or And was this a middle class problem or was this did this apply to everyone? Well, OK, first off, it, <laughs> um, what you'll read about in my forthcoming book is that uh, sequestration was applied um, uh, with a great deal of discrimination. Um, wealthy planters uh, were not the ones who fell prey to sequestration. Uh, in general, the type of people that fell prey to sequestration were small business owners, um, women, uh, widows like, uh, like Adeline White. Uh, they were basically people who were vulnerable. 
but also people who uh, who were known to be lukewarm about uh, you know about you know the Confederate cause, and so in that sense, this was kind of used as a as a loyalty test. Uh, people were sort of beaten over the head with uh, with sequestration, and you know if they didn't meet up to uh, to the standard of uh, of the local uh, uh, the local grand jury, uh, then they lost their property. And in, in many, many cases, they were arrested uh, and imprisoned, and in some cases, actually executed. Who made up the grand juries? Um, the grand juries were, as I mentioned in my talk, they were, um, uh, they were uh, organized by receivers. And what receivers did was they went to, the, literally, they went to the, the, the local uh, Democratic club, the local Democratic Party club, um, and uh, they, they got a list of uh, pro-secessionists um, and those men became members of the grand jury. And in North Carolina, that is particularly bizarre. Um, you heard me mention in here about uh, David Shank being appointed the receiver for the Western District of the Piedmont as a political favor because he and Asa Biggs were founding members of the Southern Rights Party of North Carolina. That the Southern Rights Party of North Carolina, which is, to my shock, I think is probably one of the most understudied uh, facets of, of secession in North Carolina. That is the only pro-secession political party in North Carolina. In other words, all of the all of your your fire readers in North Carolina, all of your pro-secession men who were all members of the Democratic Party, they bolted the Democratic Party, and they formed this new political party, the Southern Rights Party. And it is assumed by historians that uh, as the war unfolded that they remained loyal Democrats. They were anything but loyal Democrats. They in fact even have, uh, as, the, as part of their founding charter, the goal of dismantling the Democratic Party, you know, driving them out of politics altogether. Uh, and so that's why it's, it's kind of odd uh, in North Carolina that receivers like David Shank would go to uh, the local Democratic Club uh, to get uh, lists of, unless they were known supporters of, of secession. Uh, Rodney, were there any uh, soldiers off at the front who had their property confiscated? Oh, yes. Yes, there were. And in fact, in North Carolina, we have such a large number of deserters. Uh, and when they come back to back to, to the home fronts, uh, many of them deserted because their families had lost their property and they came back to get it back. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, uh, people like David Shank, first, as the war is still underway, um, they use the powers at their disposal, the, uh, the, the local marshal uh, and then the home guards. And then when the war is over, uh, they, uh, they kind of hide behind the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, to protect themselves and to hold on to property that they've seized. Uh, and so it, it's ugly. It's really ugly. So how many families are there in North Carolina today who can uh, trace their wealth back to that? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, Fitzhugh Brundage at, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill asked the very same question. Uh, he asked if, uh, you know, he wondered, how many New South fortunes had their origin in corruption like this? It's a thought-provoking question. That it is. Okay, so anyone else have a question for, for a swim, Ed? I'm sorry? You look like you're getting ready to go for a swim. Oh, no, I'm just sitting here. Um, I'm just, does anybody <laughs> else have a question for Rodney? What's the title of your book and when is it, when is it going to be released? The title Shameless of the book, plug opportunity. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, the title of the book is um, an, um, an Illegal Violence, the Story of Confederate Sequestration. Uh, it's going to be published with LSU Press, hopefully, hopefully, uh, maybe by uh, fall of 2021. Uh, it's putting the final touches on it. This is pretty much all of the information uh, surrounding sequestration uh, is all contained in record group 21 at the National Archives. And it's an enormous, an enormous body of records. And what's, uh, what's really stood out to me over the years is that uh, 
we have had that body of, of information uh, accessible to us since 1865. Um, and it, it's always kind of struck me as odd that uh, few, if any, historians have have asked questions about it. Uh, you know, when, I, I kind of I was always operate off of the assumption if you follow the money, uh, you're going to find sooner or later you're going to find the truth. Um, and you follow the money associated with sequestration, and the truth that you find is, boy, the the Confederate home front was messy uh, and ugly. Uh, and it wasn't the monolithic. Uh, it was, was very divided. Uh, and in fact, I think that's what we've discussed tonight kind of sheds a little bit of light on uh, some of the violence uh, on, the, uh, you know, on, on the home front after the Civil War, uh, some of the disruption and the chaos, the social uh, upheaval. Uh, and then of course, uh, the, the lasting poverty um, that uh, pervades the South and persists really well up until the 1930s uh, as a result of, of the Civil War. Well, much of that poverty is owed to, uh, to this kind of, of, of uh, transfer of wealth, if you were, will, <laughs> uh, during the war itself. Were there any judges who were assassinated after the war? Well, <laughs> there were plenty of judges who, who were threatened. Uh, Asa Biggs uh, would ultimately, uh, after the war, he set up, he put out his shingle in Tarboro uh, and uh, practiced law briefly and then moved to, to Norfolk, Virginia, uh, where he died shortly thereafter. Every judge that was whose whose activities with sequestration really stood out as questionable or even criminal and and not all of them did all right um every single one of them literally every single one of them wrote an autobiography trying to explain themselves um one judge judge brockenborough uh, of the western district of of uh, virginia well, he became the founder of Washington Lee Law School. Huh. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I have a, a friend of mine who's a student there right now, and I, I was telling him a little bit about Judge Brockenborough. And he said, kind of with a wry smile, he said, we don't talk much about him there anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're not all of the judges, uh, not all Confederate judges are involved with criminal activity, but as I mentioned, those that, that really stand out, every last one of them wrote an autobiography trying to explain themselves, uh, including Asa Biggs. Uh, and uh, that, that really, to me, that spoke volumes. Hey, Rob, Bill. hi. Hey, there he is. Hey there. Bill Jane. Hey, Bill. <laughs> I just got on. I'm oh, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> the the oh. internet was out in, it, in our whole neighborhood, and uh, it, it's uh, they just came on just now. So here I am. Sorry I missed you. Well, better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did uh, record it, right, Ed? And, and yes, we're going to we try to get, get that up on our uh, We're still recording webpage. it right now, too, so. Okay, great, great, great. I, su I suppose this is not the kind of topic that you guys normally discuss in, in your meetings. Well, we have had a couple of, uh, you know, the home front stories. Um, Jan Kroon wrote a book uh, called The War Outside My Window mm -hmm. about yes. a, yeah, a very, very bright, precocious teenager with a, uh, debilitating disease and yeah. uh, couldn't really get around and it, the title is the war outside my window so he was in Macon Georgia and saw the war war go by and commented on, on all the newspaper articles and so on and um, then we had Bert Dunkerley the uh, uh, a park ranger at Richmond National Battlefield Park talk about the bread riots right yeah you mentioned that earlier today yes yeah. Wow. Um, 
as a, an aside, I, I mentioned to you guys uh, David Shank. Uh, and in fact, I wrote a book about David Shank, a biography of him. It might be interesting to you to know that David Shank's brother-in-law was Stephen Dodson Ramser. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, that's, uh, that's, that, that was another thing that made his story rather compelling to me is that, you know, while he has this hero brother-in-law who's killed there at Cedar Creek, um, he can remain home during the war taking people's property. <laughs> it's a it's a certain kind of person that that fits uh, I guess that that fits into that role. I think Stephen Barry uh, put it put it best uh, when he said that in this story of sequestration, you have the story of men making money making war. Yeah, yeah. that's basically what it comes to. It seems like there always have been some uh, that fit that category. The, uh, yes, sadly. <laughs> well, any other questions out there? If, if not, um, well, thank you very are much. You are we going to yes. be able to rebroadcast this? I was like you. I was out without internet tonight. Tim, good to see you. No, uh, we, we recorded it. But okay. uh, if we can figure out, um, and, and I think Richard, our webmaster, may help us. Uh, we might be able to uh, get it on, on YouTube and then link okay. through our... Um, I'm sorry I missed it. It sounded very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it is. <laughs> it, it, was, it was quite interesting. It was. My Thank great grandfather much. married a rich widow. That's how he got his. <laughs> <laughs> when I read about uh, his his being brother in law to Ram Sur, I, I noticed they were really pretty close to the same age, too. Yeah. Like somehow I always thought Shank was older, but. No, no, they were, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, they were the same age. Um, and it's funny, uh, David Shank's great-grandson, I interviewed him when I was writing the book, and he explained to me that his, his great-grandfather enjoyed poor health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. That, that was his excuse for staying on the home front. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that was a good time to enjoy poor health. Yes, I'll say. <laughs> well, then uh, I'm not sure if uh, Bruce uh, Patterson or is Bruce on the uh, call. Bruce is on. Uh, yep. He's on there, but he's he's not video. He's just. Um, I assume Bruce, are you there? You, uh, you have to unmute. There he goes. Yeah, Bruce. So. Well, we'll be in touch, Rod, and if nobody else has any more questions, and uh, short of me asking you to do the whole presentation over again, just for me and Tim, that <laughs> we'll, we'll say thank you very much, and um, okay. I guess we'll, anybody else have any questions? I'm good. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, Rodney. It was great. Thank you very much for having me. And if anybody has questions they come up with later, you could just forward it to me in an email and I'd be happy to respond. Okay, and and Rod's you, book is still available on, on Amazon. And mm -hmm. I, so, uh, yeah, check that out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I've enjoyed being here. Thank good you. Too. Thank good you. Good night now. All right. Good have night. a good night, you all.